Hey guys, Dustin here, and yesterday I passed my Part 107 remote pilot test. I got a 90%. I'm really happy with the score, and for the most part, I felt really well studied and prepared for this test. However, there were definitely some curveballs that I just like wasn't expecting at all on the test. And so I wanted to just like make a super quick video while those questions were still fresh in my mind. So when you complete the test, you don't actually get to see which questions you got right and which questions you got wrong. So I am going off my memory here a little bit. Um, for some of these questions, I don't even remember all of the choices. The test is pulling from a bank of over 900 questions. So it's not likely at all that you're gonna get the same questions that I'm gonna share with you here. But the main idea here is that these are some concepts that I didn't come across in my studying for the test. And so maybe there's a good chance that, um, you know, you're not aware of these areas or concepts as well. So without further ado, let's jump right in here and talk about some of these questions that were on my test. So the first question involved a sectional chart and it asked, why would the small flag at Lake Drummond be important to a remote pilot? And the options were, a, this is a VFR checkpoint for manned aircraft, and a higher volume of air traffic should be expected there. B, this is a GPS checkpoint that can be used by both manned and remote pilots for orientation. C, this indicates that there will be a large obstruction depicted on the next printing of the chart. Okay, so when I saw this question, I thought, well, I'll just go ahead and look up the magenta flag in the chart legend. However, the legend didn't provide any helpful information as to what the symbol meant. I mean, look at this. What does this even mean? In fact, it labels the VFR checkpoint with a different symbol, even though that is, in fact, the correct answer. That's right. This is a VFR checkpoint for manned aircraft, which basically just means that there will be a higher volume of air traffic here, and you should exercise caution if flying your drone there. So after the test, I wanted to research this a bit more, and eventually I stumbled upon this diagram, which was very helpful. So in essence, just remember that magenta flags on a sectional chart equal VFR checkpoints. So the next question that I think I got wrong was, what are the characteristics of stable air? And the choices are showery precipitation, turbulent air, or poor surface visibility. I had studied the difference between stable and unstable air prior to taking the test, and it really wasn't too much of a surprise when I saw this question, but for some reason or another, I just kept getting them mixed up, and I'm pretty sure I got this question wrong on the test. The correct answer here is C, poor surface visibility. I pretty quickly eliminated B with the rationale being that if an air mass is stable, it's not going to have turbulent air. But for some reason in my head, I had made an association that stable air equals precipitation. And that's kind of correct. However, it's usually steady precipitation, not showery precipitation. So just do your best to remember that stable air equals poor surface visibility and unstable air equals turbulence and showery precipitation. Okay, so the next question that stumped me was this. Part 107 applies to A, civil and public small UAS operations, B, civil UAS operations, C, public UAS operations. And I'll be honest, I really had no idea what to choose for the answer here, so I went with A. My rationale for choosing A is that when in doubt, I found that the test usually favors all-inclusive answers, um, however, the correct answer is actually B. Um, so after doing some additional research, I found this article regarding Part 107 applicability. It says, Part 107 does not apply to operations outside of the United States, to public aircraft operations, and that's the key right there, and to aircraft 55 pounds or heavier. Um, so... Again, this is just one of those ones that, you know, I, I hadn't studied for. I, I didn't really think that the, the question or the choices were that clear. Um, so if you see this, just know that the answer is civil small UAS operations. And as much as I'd like to, you know, provide you with a thorough understanding of 
why the answer is that, I, I don't really know. So if you know, if you have a better way of explaining it, um, yeah, let us know in the comments below. You won't just help me, but you'll help other people watching this video as well. Okay, so for the next question, I really wasn't prepared for this either. Uh, it definitely caught me off guard, but the question was something like, what happens when using off-center viewing at night? And the answer to that question is, objects will disappear if viewed longer than two to three seconds. When I saw this question, I had no idea what they meant by off-center viewing. I think I actually got this question right because the other answers just were, were pretty easy to eliminate. Um, but yeah, so after reading up on this a little bit more after the test, um, I discovered that off-center viewing is a technique that requires an object be viewed at, by looking 10 degrees above, below, or on either side of the object, which allows the peripheral vision to be used to see the object. So basically, this is a technique that helps overcome a nighttime central blind spot that occurs because of the distribution of the eyes, rods, and cones. I don't know this, I'm reading this because I looked it up after the test. Um, so anyway, yeah, so it says that rods are far more, are more light sensitive than cones at night. So basically the concept here is that, you know, rather than staring directly at an object, it might be better to look slightly off by 10 degrees either on either side or above or below um, to have better visual acuity of, of that uh, subject. So again, I actually think I got this question right only because the other choices were pretty easy to eliminate. Um, however, I hadn't seen this question on any of the study guides or any of the other videos that were on YouTube as I studied for this. So I wanted to make sure I gave you a heads up and, and you might get a question or two that's related to the human vision system and how that works at night and low light areas. So um, yeah, just make sure you at least, you know, at the very least brush over that to make sure that you're as prepared as possible when you take the test. Okay, the last question that stumped me was, um, under what conditions does frost occur? And again, I can't remember the choices for the question that were provided, but I do know that they all seemed plausible and I had a hard time eliminating them. But the answer here is that when the surface temperature is below the dew point in freezing temperature. So in summary, frost forms when the surface temperature is at or below the freezing point and the air temperature reaches the dew point. I actually had quite a few weather related questions on my test. So if you haven't brushed up on that section of the, the test, make sure you do that so you're more prepared going into the test than I was. Okay, so that's it. Those were five questions that stumped me or were at the very least just like unexpected questions that I got on the part 107 remote pilot test. I hope you found this video helpful as you're studying yourself and preparing to take the test. And just to let you know, we are gonna be releasing a few more videos on how to study for this test. So make sure you subscribe to our channel so you can be prepared going in to take the test. All right, thanks so much for watching and we'll see you next time.